This is Bloomberg Intelligence. We're really getting into now the streaming arms race. Dish is looking at that and saying we can really build a nice niche for ourselves. In-depth research and data on 2,000 companies and 130 industries. The dollar is the dominant concept in the planet. I think the acquisition is a natural progression of what Microsoft can do with this technology going forward. Bloomberg Intelligence with Alex Steele and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. Over the next hour, we're going to dig inside the big business stories impacting Wall Street and the global markets. Each and every week, we provide in-depth research and data on some of the 2,000 companies and 130 industries our analysts cover worldwide. All right, today we're going to take a look at, at the week in central banks. We've got the Fed decision to munis and regulation. We have you covered on all fronts. Plus, the spending habits of UK consumers could mean trouble ahead for packaged food makers. But first, on Wednesday, the Federal Reserve officials gave their clearest signal yet. They are willing to tolerate a recession to regain control control of inflation. Policymakers raised interest rates by 75 basis points and forecast a further 125 basis points of tightening before the end of the year. Here is Jay Powell. My colleagues and I are strongly committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2% goal. We have both the tools we need and the resolve that it will take to restore price stability on behalf of American families and businesses. All right, that's some pretty clear language. If people weren't paying attention to the Federal Reserve from Jackson Hole, they certainly are now. Let's check in with Ira Jersey. He covers all things interest rates uh, for Bloomberg Intelligence. So, Ira, it, it, you know the messaging this week from the Federal Reserve, and then following up on that from other central bankers around the world, was pretty clear that fighting inflation, getting inflation down is job number one. What does that mean for the markets? I think for the markets, it means we're in for more volatility because there's still this doubt as to how high interest rates are ultimately going to get and and how uh, well those are actually going to, those hikes are actually going to feed through the the economy. You know, we've seen uh, significant increases in, say, two-year yields, breaking 4% for the first time in in a very long time. And and it could go even higher if the market starts to price for like 5% Fed funds uh, at some point in 2023, and, and we're not quite there yet. And I think that people are are really concerned that the Fed is going to, um, you know, is going to have to keep hiking because it, it just it, prices just aren't going down quickly enough. So I know this is a basic question, but high, how high can the two year actually go? At some point, it's going to reach the level that is consistent with the terminal rate that the Fed is interested in. Yeah, and, and that, but that's the problem, Alex. Like, like we keep on moving what the terminal rate expectation is. So, mm-hmm. you know, we were pretty early in our call for a four and a half percent terminal rate, which may still ultimately come true. We're somewhere within 25 basis points of that, right? That, at least that's what the dot plot was telling you from last week's uh, Federal Reserve meeting. But I think the issue is, is that there's the risk that it goes even higher, right? And, and but, but you're absolutely correct, where if the Federal Reserve is going to hike to, say, 5%, say that we're wrong and, and the Bloomberg economics team is right and the Fed hikes to 5% and then keeps it there, then the question for the two-year note is, how long do they keep it there? Because if the Fed is going to keep it there for two years, then the two-year note will have to trade somewhere near 5%. Whereas if they're going to start cutting interest rates very early, say in September of, of 2023, after the terminal rate reaches uh, reaches the high, say in March, which is not atypical, right? It's, it's, it's not unusual for the Federal Reserve to hike to some their terminal rate and then six months later start to that start to cut. And if that were to happen and we price for that, then you can actually have two-year yields that are somewhere near where they are today. And in fact, you know, we, we did an analysis. We put this on one of our T-Live blogs uh, in, on, on the terminal. And we noted that, hey, 4% is fair value for the 4.5% terminal rate and then um, the Fed starting to cut very slowly starting in late 2023. So, so we're kind of perfectly priced right now for what the dot plot is saying. The question is, are the dots going to change in the future? And that's where I think the risk in, in uh, two-year note yields come in right now. Yeah, speaking of the two-year notes, looking at the uh, two-year and the 10-year Treasury, and you know, we've got an inversion there, you know, maybe about 40 points or so. Is that enough to suggest that a recession is looming, or could we see that you know, get even larger, that inversion? Yeah, so <laughs> it's been amazingly volatile, that, that curve, um, and it's been driven both by what's going on in the two-year note and the long end and the 10-year note. We did get to touched uh, negative 50 basis points, so inverted by 50 basis points on the, on the twos tens. I, I think we could still get to, to negative 60 basis points at, at some point, but it's so volatile right now, and um, it's kind of a very consensus trade. So I think you're, one of the reasons why you're seeing these major pullbacks and, and this 
kind of ebb and flow in that particular curve is because so many people are one way in it and in the flatteners that eventually they, they take profits and into uh, into a very low liquidity environment mm-hmm. for treasuries and then uh, then the market just swings back the other way by five or ten basis points and 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 I think that kind of activity will probably continue but but you are seeing lower lows in terms of the the twos tens curve so I, I, I predict um, you know our forecast is negative 65 basis points on that particular curve um, so I do think that we're nearing the end of, of how inverted that can get. Then the question is, and this goes back to my point before, how long does the Fed stay at that terminal rate and keep short-term interest rates relatively high compared to the recent past? And if they keep it there for a long time, the curve can remain inverted for a while. And that was, our, that, that was what we even wrote in our reaction to the September uh, FOMC meeting was, hey, we can actually have a much uh, inverted yield curve for much longer than we have the last couple of cycles. Mm-hmm. But and then so so to that point, do you feel like the whippy action, the volatility, is that really going to be a back end story now? That's exactly yeah. That, that's a good point. Yes, I think that that at some point we're going to price for a more stable front end of the yield curve. And, and so two-year notes will like be at between four and four and a quarter, you know, more or less where they, um, wh- where they were this past week after the Fed meeting. And then it's really the, the, what, what goes on with the tenure and the expectations for longer-term interest rates um, that's going to ultimately uh, be moving that curve around. And you're starting to see that a little bit here and there um, in, uh, in some of the market action. All right, Ira, good stuff as always. Glimmer Intelligence Analyst, Ira Jersey. Coming up on the program, we're going to stick with the Fed and look at le- and how a rate rises are impacting the mortgage back market. You're listening to Bloomberg Intelligence on Bloomberg Radio, providing in-depth research and data on 2,000 companies in 130 industries. You can access Bloomberg Intelligence via BI Go on the terminal. I'm Paul Sweeney. And I'm Alex Steele. It is 13 minutes past the hour, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Intelligence with Alex Steele and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. Another casualty of a hawkish Fed are mortgage rates. The 30-year fixed is now over 6%, a huge move uh, in just the past year. Now, they're not buying any more mortgage-backed securities either, but they're not necessarily actively selling them at the same time. So what does this all mean for the market? Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst Erica Edelberg uh, joins us now. Erica, when do we think the Fed's going to actively sell MBS? It was interesting. Uh, the market had started interpreting comments earlier this year from the Fed that they might actually start selling sooner than later because a few Fed um, presidents have been saying that they want to move to a Treasury-only portfolio. Chairman Powell is explicit that it's not going to happen anytime soon. Our interpretation of that is that they're going to wait till a runoff is well underway. And in our discussions, we think that it probably means they really, truly are serious about not wanting to disrupt the markets. So they, I wouldn't be surprised if they wait till they see inflation stabilize, housing market stabilize, and rates stabilize, which probably, you, you tell me when that is, but you know, <laughs> certainly not before you know, first, uh, set, probably second quarter of next year at, at the earliest. When the Fed does begin to sell, who are the buyers out there? Yeah, well, it's not even that they're selling. Even letting the, letting the portfolio run off right now is okay. a concern because new issues no longer, and that's usually the worst to deliver securities, aren't being absorbed by the Federal Reserve. So the question is not only who buys then, which it's probably not going to be a huge size anyway, but who's going to buy now in the new issue market. Okay. And we think that the most likely candidates to absorb some of the slack is money managers. They've been classically underweighted as the Fed has bought. But there's nobody the size of the GSEs or the Fed that are just going to come in and wholesale buy a third of the market Mm -hmm. anymore. So it may just mean that spreads have to be a little bit wider generally than they got when the Fed was in its its buying prime. So um, banks, you mentioned uh, in this note, have been the single largest holder of MBS for most of the market's history, aside from a brief period in the early aughts. Will they be this time? Why or why not? I think uh, ultimately banks are always going to be a big key player in the mortgage market, but they don't seem to be adding, which is kind of uncharacteristic for them. They had added an extra amount relative to their normal holdings in the last couple of years because their deposits had grown on pandemic-related savings. Uh, you know, there's a little less loan demand, but recently that has switched, and their deposits 
are actually not growing for the first time. You know, it's very rare in their history their deposits haven't been growing. I think that's partly because some money is going to money market funds, which aren't classically huge buyers of anything but floating rate mortgages. So right now, it doesn't look like banks are going to be the dominant support in the mortgage market. Maybe in you know in the near term, maybe, maybe going forward they will be, but certainly not you know between now and let's say year end. How about hedge funds? Do I don't hear about Stevie Cohen, you know, dominating the mortgage market or anything like that. Are hedge funds big players in MBS? Hedge funds are still pretty big players in MBS, but probably not to the degree that they have been perhaps, uh, you know, times in the past. Most of the hedge funds that I've talked to, because I kind of came from that world yep. before I came to Bloomberg, most of them right now have been shying away from mortgages in recent, you know, like in 2020, 21, except for maybe uh, es- more esoteric products because the spreads had gotten so tight mm. and they really couldn't find a space where they could make you know money in there. And uh, some hedge funds have definitely been venturing back into the market this year. You see, when you just look at flow of funds, uh, what they call households have been adding mortgage-backed securities, and that includes hedge funds, interestingly. <laughs> so they've been one of the few uh, bright lights in the sector as the Fed has been pulling back. But I don't think they have enough cash to really move the needle to to absorb the supply the Fed's not going to be absorbing anymore. My household is not a hedge fund. I'm just going to put okay. that Yeah, just so we're clear. Um, uh, REITs, what about them? REITs are still not really excited about the mortgage-backed securities market. They're very worried about uncertainty around Fed policy. Maybe Powell's trying to reassure them as much as anybody in in what he talked about this week when he said that they're not going to be selling anytime soon. But, you know, talking Mm -hmm. to uh, the people who cover REITs here, the REITs have been, if anything, venturing into other types of products like, you know, uh, mortgage servicing at the expense of mortgage-backed securities, and their equity has been down so far, uh, their their stock prices, that yep. it's made it difficult for them to really add anything right now. I'm looking at the Bloomberg U.S. Municipal Bond Total Return Index year-to-date off, you know, a little more than 11%, kind of in line with some of the other parts of the fixed income space. What's the, when you talk to some of your smart institutional investor clients, what are they saying about what they're doing in this market here, given kind of what we know the Fed's going to be doing? You know, a lot of them are still on hold. Okay. Um, but the ones that are adding are trying to do so in some of the more interesting products. Like uh, I talked to a big money manager last week, and they agreed that loan balance pools, for instance, is, is one sector to look at because they're likely to give you some free payment protection given how high loan sizes have gotten and that the Fed's not going to be taking out the worst to deliver. Mm-hmm. Loan balance is one place you can go where you can get some prepayment protection. You know, if if rates do rally again, or you know, even a little bit. Um, if you're talking about a, a higher coupon mortgage, even a little bit rally could trigger some of these people with four hundred thousand dollars loans to want to refinance. Mm-hmm. Um, and on the flip side, I can't imagine they, there's anyone left to refinance at this point after yeah, rates like no, it's it, it would really just be the newer you know people who just. I, I know I've talked to some. Homeowners who have taken out mortgages recently, like and they say, and they say, you know, I'll take it out now, and I just hope the rates go down, and we can, you know, refinance. Uh, so it's mm-hmm. more because there aren't really penalties in our market, so it's really more the the recent home buyers who aren't as concerned as you might think about having to take out higher rates because they figure they'll just refinance if things turn around. So prepayment protection in the form of something like loan balance against that type of risk is, you know, prudent. And then in the lower coupons. The higher loan size you have, the more you'll feel locked into that two percent mortgage rate. You know, you don't want to take out another five hundred thousand dollar loan at six percent if yep. you currently have a two percent mortgage. So, the smaller loan sizes, they have more trade up. You know, they're in smaller homes to begin with, so that they may be more likely to move into a larger home. And at the same time, they're not as locked into that one mm. payment conceivably. That's yeah, I have two point seven five, and I'm Ooh, like, sorry, look at you, never moving again. Like I don't <laughs> care what happens. Like I'm never giving that puppy up. Um. I, I guess as we wrap up the conversation here, how confident are we that the Fed is at some point actively going to sell mortgage-backed securities? I, is there a scenario where they just hold them until maturity? I think there's a pretty good scenario where they just hold them until maturity because they, they I mean, granted, they're going to probably do what's called QCIP consolidation, where they take all these small pools and make them into larger pools, which mm-hmm. makes selling easier. But it's still, when you have that larger size of portfolio, not only are you likely to disrupt the markets, but I think it's also complicated to figure out how to get the right values for the mortgages as these mortgages season. They probably don't want to just sell them into the generic TBA market if they have seasoning in them. So I think the mechanics of actually trying to sell them, the longer they hold them, the more complicated it gets. 
All right, Erica, thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst Erica Edelberg. Coming up on the program, we go from MBS to munis, all through the lens of the Federal Reserve. You're listening to Bloomberg Intelligence on Bloomberg Radio, providing in-depth research and data on 2,000 companies and 130 industries. You can access Bloomberg Intelligence through BI Go on the terminal. I'm Alex Steele. And I'm Paul Sweeney. It's 25 minutes past the hour, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Intelligence with Alex Steele and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. We'll be here each and every week at this time, tapping into our Bloomberg Intelligence analysts covering some 2,000 companies and 130 industries worldwide. Alex, you know I am into the municipal bond market. They litter my portfolio all over the place. I've been in the market for quite some time. That's why I like talking munis. And we have Eric Kazaski. He covers all things municipal bonds for Bloomberg Intelligence. So, Eric, I mean, we we heard loud and clear from this Federal Reserve. They are super duper serious in this whole inflation thing. Rates are going to continue to go higher. What's that mean for your muni market? More losses, right? But I will say, with more losses comes great opportunity. Oh, there we go. There's a sell side out. <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. There you go. Always a silver lining. Look, the way I see it, if you're income buyer, if you're trying to generate income in your portfolio, things are on sale right now. Four uh, percent coupons, they're off about 12, 15 points from the beginning of this year. Five percent coupon structure is off about 10 points. So if you're trying to build up those income streams, it's still a good time. What's the relationship between munis and Fed rate hikes? You know, in typical Fed rate hike cycles and mm-hmm. things of a historic nature, munis have typically outperformed. And we're seeing that this year, right? They're outperforming corporates by three, 350 basis points. And that's great. But you know what? I think it's really start, It's hard to get investors excited when they're still looking at 10% losses year to date in their portfolio. And that's why you have to sort of continue to sort of talk about those silver linings, right? Better credit quality outperformance as we get further into a hike cycle and the opportunity to add income at a discount level. Talk to me about new issue. You've, you told us in the past that municipal bond issuers are not that rate sensitive. They just kind of raise money when they need it. What are your expectations for rate? Is- I mean, for issuance? You know what? Up until last week, I would have agreed with previous points where I've told you that. But we've seen issuance sort of drop off the face of the earth. So we look at sort of forward supply over the next 30 days. And typically that tends to drop off in weeks where we have FOMC meeting and you have a rebound after you get that announcement. We haven't seen that rebound yet. So right now over the next 30 days, the market as we're showing it on our calendars is only about 5.8 billion in supply. That's anemic. And what that means is that it's gonna put further pressure on the market because it means less price discovery and more uncertainty for people who are already sitting on the sidelines. Where are we seeing the most activity and where are we seeing the drying up? I would say drying up activity is anything 10 years and out on the curve. We've really struggled with illiquidity and depth of the market for most of this year as the market sold off. And I think the last couple of weeks have really exacerbated that. You know, we've got anecdotal evidence from people we've talked to who are trading the long end and, you know, there's hardly any bids showing up. And that makes it really hard to want to commit risk in this environment. As far as where we're seeing increased activity, it's really going to be in that separately managed account driven space five years and in on the curve, where there's been an extreme amount of pressure put on where yields have gone. And it's really created this distortion in our market versus where short munis are versus short treasuries. And we look really rich still. Eric, the Fed chairman seems to be not that concerned about potentially pushing this economy into a recession. If that's what it takes to bring down inflation. If that is in fact the case, are there credit risks in your market that you know some of your your clients are really focused on at this point? I would say not right at this point. And and I sort of look to the rating agencies as sort of the canary in the coal mine as far as you know where they are seeing trends or where they're seeing pockets of sort of concern. And if you look at aggregate data for the year, there's still been a tremendous amount of upgrade activity versus anything going put on Credit Watch or any uh, negative trends at all. So we think that's likely to persist going forward because a lot of these state and local governments are still working through some of that COVID cash that they had as well. Now, look, obviously this depends on sort of the depth and and severity of the recession. Mm -hmm. Um, And yes, um, Jerome Powell has certainly come out and said he doesn't really care about employment or your asset prices. So that is sending a message loud and clear to the market. I think the the concern is that supply continues to sort of be anemic and the market sort of struggles with that illiquidity issue more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, And people 
finding natural buyers. Yeah, I, I feel like the Fed doesn't care about employment until they care about employment, I guess, this, <laughs> this time around at yes. asset value. So fair enough. Um, <laughs> okay, so in a scenario where the Fed has blinders on and they're just targeting the 2% inflation, what yeah. kind of defaults do you expect? I think it's going to go back to the historical default report that Moody's is famous for. And I don't think anything's going to change from that standpoint that we're going to see anything more than that, like 0.1 statistical level, right? Um, Muni Credit has proven resilience during the pandemic, you know, in previous recessionary cycles. And I don't think that's going to change going forward. I think it's really going to be an issue of if we have meaningfully higher rates, what are going to be the appetite of issuers to want to continue to finance in the capital markets? when they're going to have other needs that are sort of crowding out, such as pension and other retirement expenses that are indeed going to get more expensive. All right, Eric, I'm born, raised in the swamps of Jersey, and I couldn't help but notice that Fitch recently upgraded the state of New Jersey. What's behind the upgrade other than all the taxes I'm paying? I I think they've done a good job of addressing their fiscal house far from being in order. So let's be perfectly clear about that. You know, but I think the, the opportunity, if you're a New Jersey domiciled investor, to get tax exempt income um, that on an equivalent yield is close to 7%. It's really a good time right now to sort of lock in those opportunities. All right. See, you can get a taxable equivalent if you live in a state of New Jersey close to 7%. I didn't know you were big into Moonies. That's what I'm now talking to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's He's what I'm huge into Moonies. Exactly. I, I, usually, I, I tell every governor I meet I'm the single largest creditor to the state of uh, <laughs> New Jersey. All right. Our thanks to Bloomberg Intelligence analyst Eric Kazatsky. Coming up on the program, from interest rate hikes to more regulation, we're going to look at how regional U.S. banks are dealing with the Fed. You're listening to Bloomberg Intelligence on Bloomberg Radio, providing in-depth research and data on 2,000 companies and 130 industries. You can access Bloomberg Intelligence via BI Go on the terminal. I'm Paul Sweeney. And I'm Alex Steele. It's 39 minutes past the hour, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Intelligence with Alex Steele and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. Well, this week on Capitol Hill, you had the big banks like uh, J.P. Morgan and Bank of America and Citi, as well as the big U.S. regional banks, have to go to the House and the Senate uh, to testify one big part of that conversation is how much money these banks have to hold to protect against losses. We know that's the story for the big investment banks, but what about for the regional guys? Let's get more into this with Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst Arnold Kakuda. Arnold, the U.S. Bank Corp., the PNC, the truest, what kind of capital are they going to need to start holding? Well, yeah, it's more um, capital, you know, we think of more as like the equity and, um, you know, they're, they're very healthy and stuff. But kind of the new thing coming down the pipeline is potential debt requirements that these uh, guys, these three big regionals might need to hold. And um, yeah, we think maybe $90 billion of extra debt that can be kind of bailed in and written down in a time of crisis, that might be you know what's needed to appease these Biden-elected regulators, uh, such as uh, Michael Barr at the Fed. It's interesting. I thought the, uh, the story we've been hearing from the banks is that their credit position, their capital position is as strong as it's ever been, but they still might need certain types of debt on their balance sheet? Yeah. So this uh, bail-in debt you know, um, requirement was, was only really for the biggest banks like the JP Morgans and Wells Fargo's. And so I guess when you were still on the, on the, on the research side, Paul, you know, you'd know me as the TLAC man, yep. total loss absorbing capacity and, and how much debt you know, at that time, this was like six, seven years ago that you know, the big banks, you know, at the time that was a new regulation that they would need to you know, issue to comply, you know, to, to be in, in, in compliance. So right now, I guess, you know, we're, we're in a phase of on the equity side, these requirements for the big banks, the, the biggest banks are going up. And so that's why you have Jamie Dimon kind of chirping about, oh, no, you know, why do we have to hold this, all this equity? You know, we're one of the safest and whatnot. But now now this focus has shifted, um, you know, with these new Biden elected regulators, they're kind of looking at the here below the biggest banks and saying, you know what, you know, on my watch, I don't want, you know, any of these big guys, if something were to happen, right, you know, the only, if something were to happen, it's only like, you know, the biggest guys that would absorb them. And so, um, you know, maybe, maybe we should make these, um, you know, the PNCs, the, the uh, truest, the U.S. Bank Corps, maybe we should make them more, you know, easy to resolve in, in case something happens. And, and a path to that could be to require them to issue, to have enough debt that's eligible to be written down and converted to equity hmm. you know, in a time of crisis. Is this a good idea? <laughs> well, it depends on who you ask. And any new type of uh, regulation isn't really, you know, uh, welcomed by, by the banks themselves. And, you know, I, I, think, I think there is argument for, for the U.S. Bank Corps, PNC, and Truist. I mean, these guys did fine throughout the, uh, throughout the crisis, right? And, 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 you know, they were able to get bigger and bigger by, by acquiring weaker partners. But, you know, as these guys have gotten so big, right, each of them have over $550 billion of assets, 
or, you know, uh, or more. And, um, and so really the path to, you know, if something were to happen to these entities, how can they, you know, be resolved, right? And so, you know, the issue of too big to fail is, you know, they're, they're, they're global systemically important banks. You know, we have these de- designations because these are the firms that if there was a, something wrong with them, we couldn't shut them down for a weekend or weeks and, and then kind of, you know, r- you know, go through bankruptcy and, and, and have customer, you know, assets frozen, right? So the reason why, the, you know, the regulation is now these guys have to now have enough uh, bail in debt to kind of revive them and keep them going is because they can't be shut down. Now, so the argument is, okay, so will that also be, you know, uh, will, they, will these other entities in, in the U.S., these uh, U.S. bank corps, are they domestically systemically important? Meaning, do they have to be able to be revitalized in a time of crisis or can, can, can they go through the regular bankruptcy process where, okay, shut it down on Friday, okay, who's available to kind of pick up the assets over the weekend and on Monday morning, you know, open up as a new branch, right? And so right. I think that's what, you know, these, these new regulators are saying, okay, I don't want this to happen on my watch. Right. And then maybe we need to do something about it. When will we get some clarity, Arnold, about kind of when and if some of these banks will need, in fact, to, uh, you know, issue this debt? OK, so um, this chapter is really driven by the OCC. Uh, and then um, it seems like the FDIC is kind of on board. But the big guy to really pay attention to is Michael Barr at the Fed. And um, you know, he's coming in as the new uh, vice chair of regulation. And so. Um, you know, it's great we have Nathan Dean, our regulatory guy down in Washington. And so he thinks, um, you know, we'll hear a speech from him. You know, he's already talked a couple of times about this, you know, kind of referencing uh, a potential, you know, thing happening. But I, th- I think Nathan thinks in 4Q, you know, we'll hear something more. And then potentially early 2023, we'll, we'll get a proposal on this. And he's like, you know, 6% plus uh, sure this will happen. And then in terms of implementation, I mean, maybe more in like 2025. So, you know, there there is you know, time, you know, if, if they were to, you know, the, these dominoes were to kind of fall in place, there is time for each of these, you know, big three banks, big three regional banks to kind of make up, you know, each of their kind of maybe 30 billion or so of, um, you know, extra, you know, bill and eligible debt that they might need to issue. All right, Arnold, thanks so much. We super appreciate it. Arnold Kakuda, a Bloomberg intelligence analyst. All right, we turn away from the Fed now, but we stick with economic data. This time, it's consumer numbers in the UK, specifically food delivery. From where we bring in Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst Diana Gomes. Diana, thanks so much for joining us here. Boy, when, when we were all locked down, the food delivery companies, they were savior for uh, many, many folks, and it was reflected in their business. They did some just some you know incredibly uh, strong business. Now we're kind of coming out of this pandemic. Is it the other side of the coin here that they're dealing with? Yes, uh, exactly. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, we we all got used to online food delivery, specifically getting our restaurant, uh, favorite restaurant foods uh, delivered at home was quite a nice convenience during lockdown. And uh, it turns out that uh, these uh, habits uh, are getting hard to die in a way. So um, we still see uh, when looking at uh, the UK market specifically, which is one of the few profitable markets in, in the industry and a very competitive one as well. So looking at the, the UK market at the moment, there are still about a third of uh, consumers saying that they still order at least once a week, hmm. take away, uh, which is uh, restaurant delivery, uh, or even um, do uh, grocery shopping uh, online. So definitely quite a, a consistent behavior that uh, we, we are still seeing. But yes, there are some challenges ahead, uh, not just growth that will slow down naturally from a really high base as people just go out more and spend more time away from home and mm-hmm. go back to enjoying the social things we, we used to do before the pandemic. You know, um, to, to, to be honest, I've actually stopped doing that because it's gotten so expensive. Like with inflation, even just the delivery fee and tip has like really priced me out. And I'm wondering what the inflationary effect has been on demand. So that is exactly one of the questions we ask on the survey. And uh, a staggering uh, big number of people did say that they are seeking discounts or deals more often over the last three months. So about 80% of the respondents said that they are doing that. And these discounts would offset that increase we we see in uh, the menu prices and also on the delivery fees. 
And in the UK, uh, we have um, the key companies such as Deliveroo, who have been really increasing, uh, who are really increasing fees, but overall uh, just splitting them across different names. So we have a service fee and we have a delivery fee on the side, and then we may have a a fee for faster service if we order with Uber Eats. But I know that uh, across uh, countries, the practices can be quite different. Hey, Diana, give us a sense of just the profitability or lack thereof of these food delivery companies. Mm -hmm. Just give us a sense of how that's developed and how you think it might go going forward. It's a very interesting question because most of the the companies are not making money. There, there has been um, a good turn of events for companies like DoorDash in the U.S., which became profitable during the pandemic, and it's managing to, to sustain that. And when I say profitable, I'm looking at uh, adjusted EBITDA, which is more of a cash profit metric, um, not necessarily profitable at uh, bottom line EPS. But, uh, yes, yeah, so looking at these um a bit, uh, um, which is the key metric, um, DoorDash has been profitable. And uh, Just the Takeaway, which is the, the leader in the UK, was profitable. Uh, it's one of the legacy companies, so it started in the 2000s. Um, the business evolved and they, they had to respond to disruptor companies such as uh, the, the Ibru, uh which is similar to DoorDash. So having to invest into all, into all these logistics and technology really changed the dynamic. Mm-hmm. And um, over the last two years, just it decided to sacrifice profit in order to uh, keep their edge and uh, really stab off some of the competition. So do we feel that the equities have re-rated to account for this at this point? Exactly. So, um, because most of the, the sector is still loss making, when we see when we are in an environment where interest rates are increasing, the valuation for these companies really gets under pressure because the the potential profits are far into the future. And at the same time, we have some of these companies that have uh, a big chunk of uh, debt in the form of convertible bonds. And these bonds were issued when the market was really expecting strong growth. Really, we were at the peak of demand. There were billions uh, raised uh, between 2020 and 2021. And these convertible bonds are now very out of the money. So that means that uh, companies like Just Eat Takeaway and Delivery Hero, they have a few billion euros in uh, convertible bonds that are maturing and so the, there is definitely more investors' pressure for companies to show that they can either return to profit, in just this case, or finally break even to really show that right. their liquidity is robust. All right, enough. Diana, thank you so much. That's really good stuff. Diana Gomes, she covers consumer products for Bloomberg Intelligence uh, across Europe, and she's based in London. And that's this week's edition of Bloomberg Intelligence on Bloomberg Radio, providing in-depth research and data on 2,000 companies and 130 industries. And remember, you can access Bloomberg Intelligence via BIGO on the terminal. I'm Paul Sweeney. And I'm Alex Steele. It's 57 minutes past the hour, and this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg. 